This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is time to talk some player props for the conference championships in the NFL, and there is a lot to discuss, and we've got the best in the business to do so for today. That is J.J. Zacharyson. and we're going to talk player props across both of the key games on Sunday with J.J. picking his brain on where he sees value, and then later on, we'll talk Austin Cass and talk some EPL for Match Week 22. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, joined here to start things off by jj zacharies and check him out on twitter at late round qb find his work at late round.com and the late round fantasy football podcast and also has his prospect guide for the 2024 nfl draft now they'll pre-order i got mine in on wednesday so already uh locked and loaded on my end but jj it's our last chat and i'm sad about that because when we're doing the video version I can see you as the intro music is playing and you're usually dancing or singing during the intro song. And so the like brightest part of my Friday will be gone without the dancing or singing. So I'm a little bit sad about this. None of your, none of your other guests are, uh, are going to pitching ninja Rob Friedman, Rob Friedman, like headbangs. Like he asked me to send him the file. I've not done so because I'm negligent, but like, he asked me to send the file of the intro song because he likes it so much, but like he headbangs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I should dancing is a little bit more, uh, rhythmic. Yeah. Yeah. I should probably put the, the, uh, the, the intro on my running playlist. Yeah. (laughs) to To get me fired up just randomly. I'll be listening to some uh, I, I listen to some very bad hip hop and stuff whenever I'm okay. to get like a good beats per minute going, you know, to, like yeah. have your 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 pace going with it. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, just having that thrown in there for 30 seconds would really, you know, chef's yeah. this to the playlist. My workout playlist is was it on a Madden soundtrack in the 2000s? It mm. is probably on my playlist and it's probably been there. Like it's probably in my like Spotify on repeat to this yeah, day. Yeah, like, like Andrew WK, Party Hard oh, yeah. on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like, there are some unthinkable things that I refuse to admit publicly on there. And I've like gone to concerts for these people and it's like, I just can't stop listening to old Madden soundtracks. And I no, feel look, like I... I- Oh, look, I got update. I, no judgment here. I have a I have a playlist on Spotify called Video Game Soundtracks, and it's got a bunch of Madden songs, got some Tony Hawk songs. Yeah. The Tony Hawk soundtrack back in the day was straight, straight fire. Uh, MVP so, Baseball 2005 shredded. There you go. Shredded. Was that the uh, one with Manny on the front? Who was yeah, it was front? Manny. Okay. It had the song like Tessie uh, by Dropkick Murphys. Okay. Uh, it had uh, a bunch of really good ones. I, uh Oh, me and I owe you, I think was on there. Mm. Um, I'm just going to go through these again later on today. So yeah. this is this has been uh, uh, an uplift once again. So even as I no longer get to watch you watch, I still get to benefit from our conversations. At yes. least yes. as I go back through MVP baseball 2005, the soundtrack later on today, we're going to dig into player props for both games here with JJ to get you ready for those outline where he sees value at FanDuel Sportsbook. And again, later on today, Austin Castle joined the show to break down his thoughts on EPL match week 22, which began next week on Tuesday. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We are still here every weekday throughout the non-NFL season as well. Breaking down NBA, NHL. We'll talk some NASCAR before the Daytona 500. All that stuff in the mix here on the podcast feed. And of course, on FanDuel TV Plus and the FanDuel YouTube page as well. So make sure you subscribe on your platform of choice. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or a thumbs up over on YouTube. Now, JJ, let's begin things by talking about the Ravens and the Chiefs game. On the Chiefs side for props, we know where the ball is going. On the Ravens side... Beats me, man. Uh, yeah. Any baseline props you're targeting here for Ravens versus Chiefs? Yeah, so let's start at the tight end position. I, I think tight end's really interesting because Kansas City uh, this season has funneled a lot of targets towards the tight end position. I know last week Buffalo didn't use their tight ends the way, in my opinion, the way they should have. And I think that's part of the reason why they lost that game uh, is because they didn't use Kincaid and Knox uh, in the way that they should have. Uh, but, you know, obviously this Baltimore offense uses their tight ends at a pretty decent rate, even without Mark Andrews, you know, over the last X number of weeks, Isaiah likely has just stepped in and seen like a 20% target share pretty consistently within that offense. So you got Mark Andrews sounds like probably coming back. They're being a little bit weird about it because whether they think it's a competitive advantage or not, I have no idea, but Mark Andrews could come back. Now, 
if you look at his line, I think it's 35 and a half right now receiving. To me, that tells you that, you know, books are just kind of playing it safe. They don't know if he's healthy or not, right? Because if he were healthy, that line would be 10 to 15 yards higher uh, easily. I mean, mm-hmm. probably even more. And so the way that I kind of approach this would be, I might go with the under on just the receiving yardage line because that would tell me, okay, he's uh, not healthy in that case, right? Uh, but then I would be more intrigued with like the super overs uh, and like like the bigger bets with him. Like one of them I really like is just this week being the leading receiver in the oh. championship matchups. It's plus 2,800. It's 28 to one right now. Um, because I think if Mark Andrews plays and is healthy, he's going to hit the over on that mark for sure. But I would just rather go harder with it because that line is just naturally a little bit lower. Um, so you can hedge a little bit if you want to and say, okay, he's not healthy. So I'm going to hit the under on his, on his normal line and then go with the over um, and some of these alt lines. And, and, you know, you're looking at it right now, Jim, where uh, you can get some pretty good juice, uh, you know, even over 50 yards is plus 178 right now. So I would look that way with Mark Andrews this week, um, because I do think that, that, you know, typically we see guys come back and yeah, there's going to be some hindrance, but I don't think guys, even in the playoffs, like, like this is around the time frame that they thought that Mark Andrews could come back from this injury. It's not Mm -hmm. some rush job where, uh, you know, he wouldn't be able to, to, to perform to some, at some level and to some degree. So, uh, I do think Andrews is pretty intriguing mostly because the matchup is there. Um, and then also within the, uh, that, that offense, uh, the chiefs this season, they've sort of objectively faced three mobile quarterbacks this year. I say objectively because there's, you know, let's say that there's like eight truly mobile quarterbacks across the league or something. Uh, but they faced Justin Fields, Jalen hurts, and now Josh Allen twice, each of those guys hit. 10 plus rush attempts against them. Josh Allen did that uh, in both games uh, against Kansas City. Kansas City actually, Jim, has allowed the, and this is obviously opponent based to some degree, but they have allowed the most rush attempts against them this season. And obviously, Kansas City was a good team. This isn't like a kneel down stat or anything like that. I mean, they were seeing a lot of rush attempts against them. It could be because they play man at a decently high rate. Um, and that, you know, allows running or allows quarterbacks to kind of just get out there, scramble. And if they don't see it, you know, these guys are covering their individual players. And so they can just kind of run, uh, Lamar Jackson right now, his rush attempt number is 10 and a half. I'm tempted to take that over, um, because of the way that the chiefs have defended the quarterback position this season. Uh, and then there's Isaiah Pacheco. I know that he's banged up. There's some question marks there. Sounds like he's going to go. I mean, earlier this week, he said, I'm going to play, Mm -hmm. um, his line, his rushing yard line, I think his rushing yard line is important to focus on here because they haven't been using him that much as a receiver over the last couple of games that they played. Um, so there is a little bit of ambiguity as to, um, you know, is he going to see the target share that we need him to see to hit a total no- number? Uh, but it's 63 and a half rushing yards. I like the over there. Uh, he's hit this by a really good margin in, in each of his last three games. Uh, the Ravens were good against, against Devin Singletary last week. Yes. Uh, but that was also a pretty negative game script and, and, you know, it's just not the way that this Texans offense is not necessarily this like massively great rushing attack and and running offense. Um, But against good running backs the last month or so Baltimore, they faced Najee Harris in a pretty irrelevant game. I understand that. Uh, And then Devon Achan, CMC, Kyron Williams, all of those guys, including Najee Harris went over a hundred yards rushing against Baltimore. Um, And so uh, again, Pacheco's receiving numbers, they haven't been that strong, but his rushing numbers have been there. Um, and he saw 88% of the team's running back rushes this past week. Jarek McKinnon being sidelined. We've seen a good bump in those splits with Pacheco. So I'm going to go with the over there. And I think that could hit regardless of game script. And with Pacheco's health, I'm pretty sure the injury occurred in that run down the, the left sideline that he had. And he kind of like turned his ankle and they say it's an ankle slash toe injury for him. He came back in the game after that. And like you said, said on Wednesday, I'm going to play. Yeah. So that to me says... Decent amount of conviction he'll go. You talked about that match with the Texans. I think we'll see a pretty similar schematic approach for the Ravens defense where they're they're very malleable to their opponent. And so the Texans last week, they said, like, we dare you to run. And right. the Texans are like, we can't, man. Yeah. But the Chiefs can. And I think they've proven that. Even with Joe Tooney likely out, I still think they can run the football against this defense. So because they're a team that can beat you in multiple ways and actually can with the ball on the ground, I think we'll see the Ravens inviting them to run and – Hopefully Andy Reid has the patience to keep with that. But I think based on what we've seen the past month and a half, I think he will have that patience yeah. here. Yeah. I think they they have to, too. I mean, look yeah. at 
like like they've they've had a deficiency at, at wide receiver all season long. I mean, it's right. it's been an issue for them all year. And now you're in the conference championship. You got to rely on on what got you there and what's helped you. And that's a decent enough run game and Isaiah Pacheco playing well. And then obviously Travis Kelsey and Rasheed Rice. That's the offense right now. Right. So props JJ Locks likes here as far as the yardage numbers. Uh likes Mar- Mark Andrews under 35 and a half minus 110, but then potentially also alt markets on Andrews to lead the conference championships in receiving 28 to 1. Uh, but also some alt markets, 50 plus receiving yards is plus 178. Lamar Jackson over 10 and a half rushes minus 115. And Isaiah Pacheco over 63 and a half rushing yards. That is minus 110. What about touchdown props? Anything stand out to you in this game there? Yeah, look, the other thing that I think you could go with, and this is related to the touchdown prop, but I, I think Justice Hill's receiving number is really intriguing. It's 12 and a half. Uh, he's basically gotten there uh, in, in three of his last four. He didn't last week, but I don't anticipate the game script necessarily being the same against Kansas City as it was against Houston. Uh, if it's closer, then they're going to likely use uh, a back out of the backfield as a receiver more frequently. And Baltimore was a pretty run heavy team this past week in general. So uh, I think that's intriguing. But also, Justice Hill this past week played 57% of Baltimore snaps Um, in games where he's hit a 50% snap rate. He's hit over 10 rush attempts as a median. Uh, And so he's, you know, you could also bet his over in rush attempts if you want to as well, which is like seven and a half, but uh, given all that. So I think that, you know, they're using him a little bit more or they did. There's a lot of volatility to the the Baltimore backfield. There's no doubt. Uh, And so I'm just going to embrace the volatility a little bit and look at him as an anytime touchdown scorer at plus 300 and say, look, last week, you know, everyone obviously will look at Gus Edwards and say, you're the goal line back. And that's true. Uh, but last week, Justice Hill actually played more snaps in the red zone than Gus Edwards did. And that's not that inconsistent than what we've seen throughout the season. And so you're really asking and hoping for maybe a seven to 15 yard touchdown as opposed to a goal line look from the running back, because I do think that Gus Edwards would still be the goal line guy. Um, but they use Justice Hill, basically, that's what I'm getting at. They use Justice Hill in a, in a pretty decent way this past week. And we know that he's going to be on the field for a lot of those receiving reps. Uh, and, and I feel more confident about this, too, because we did see them with Dalvin Cook last week. Maybe they give Dalvin right. Cook a little bit more work, but he was just an end of game kind of grinder for them, which could happen again if they do end up winning. So I like Justice Hill at, at plus 300 as an anytime touchdown scorer. Okay, plus 300 for Justice Hill. And I think that, like... We talk about this from a data perspective, but from like a, you know, watch the film bro perspective, Justice Hills looked good. He's got so, juice, man. Yeah. Like why bother deviating if it's working the way it is? And yep. he could get here via a receiving touchdown too. So it doesn't have to be just the rushing stuff for Justice Hill. So I think three to one, very good number for him. Let's talk now about the second game on Sunday. That is the Lions at the 49ers. We've seen some movement here again towards the over. It's now 51 and a half, and the spread is up to seven and a half uh, in favor of the 49ers here. For the Niners and Lions game, we do have key props up, despite the fact that Debo Samuel's uh, availability is up in the air. So any value in yardage or usage props here for the Lions and 49ers? Yeah, one thing I'll say about Debo, where I don't necessarily feel this way about Mark Andrews, is that we've seen Debo in the past play and sort of be a decoy. Uh, And so that could happen again, which Mm -hmm. means if he does play, I wouldn't automatically just like drastically lower a Brandon Ayuk or a CMC uh, projection uh, because we we have seen in the past, even this season, you know, Debo be banged up and and sort of just be on the field and not get a lot of looks. Um, With that being said, I think just from like a general football perspective, uh, you know, a guy like Ayuk is not playing the same type of wide receiver as a guy like Debo Samuel. A player like Christian McCaffrey is playing the same kind of, of of role in that offense as a Debo Samuel. You know, closer to the, to the line of scrimmage targets, lower A dot looks, uh, those short area targets. And he did have insane usage last week. I mean, last week, CMC saw every single uh, uh, running back rush for the 49ers. And then he also saw 33% target share in that offense. And so... I, I am intrigued a little bit if, if we learn that Debo's out or if you want to bet it now, uh, if you think that he could be a decoy. Uh, I, I am pretty intrigued by Christian McCaffrey hitting the over of his receiving yard line. Now, it's not the best matchup in the world. Last week's matchup way better against Green Bay for Christian McCaffrey than this Detroit one is. Um, but I actually think what, I'm more, what I have more conviction towards and about is actually the running backs on the Lions and, mm. and not Christian McCaffrey. I have Jameer Gibbs over 22 and a half receiving yards. I also have David Montgomery over five and a half receiving yards. Um, I, I think both those numbers are just too low, just naturally too low. San Francisco this season, Jim, 
They've allowed the fourth highest adjusted target share to running backs, and they've allowed the seventh most raw running back receiving yards. So when teams face the 49ers, oddly, because obviously they have a good front, uh, they're targeting their running backs at, at a slightly higher rate. That could be game script related. That's fine. Look at the game script of what this game is likely going to, to and how this game is likely going to unfold. Uh, Jameer Gibbs has been at 43 and 40 receiving yards over their two playoff games. And those were in two pretty neutral game scripts. He saw four targets in both of them, caught four passes. Um, again, this negative game script means that they're likely going to lean on Gibbs a little bit more than David Montgomery. Um, and they probably should just given the way, I mean, Jameer Gibbs last week, Jim had like an 89% success rate on the ground. It was just absolutely absurd how good he was last week. Um, so I think the matchup there and how teams are targeting their running backs is intriguing for Gibbs and the negative game script, but David Montgomery, I don't mind his over either five and a half receiving yards. You know, obviously he can maybe catch one and, and be under that mark, but that's, you know, one and a half ish receptions. Um, and if you look at his route participation, it's increased in the playoffs by about 10 percentage points. So he ran more routes than Gibbs last week. Exactly. Exactly. So they're, they're using Montgomery more as a receiver. And then you, you layer on this matchup. I think they, they, they need to use Montgomery in that way to keep the defense honest too. Um, and so I just, I, I think that, that both of those numbers are just a little bit too low. I would bet them, uh, I, I would bet the, the Montgomery number up to seven and a half and then the, the, the Gibbs number probably up to like 26, 27 and a half. And you don't have to do that right now. Cause that right now is as at FanDuel Sportsbook, as you mentioned, Gibbs 22 and a half over is minus 110. Same thing for, uh, Montgomery over five and a half minus 115 for him. And I think so I was talking about Montgomery running more routes. I think what's encouraging for Gibbs is that he looked good in pass protection last week, which was yeah. not the case earlier on this year. Like he stuffed a dude in the hole uh, this past week. So I would expect the route numbers to be pretty equal, which is good for both these guys with regards to the prop uh, that you were discussing there. What about the touchdown side of things? Anything stand out to you in this game there? Yeah, I don't love the touchdown market in this game, to be honest. So I'm just going to throw a dart and it'll be more fun that way. <laughs> uh, I like Juwan Jennings as an anytime touchdown scorer at plus 310. We talked about Debo maybe even being a decoy. If Debo doesn't go, maybe this line shifts a little bit, but it might not. Uh, you could wait as a result of that uh, just to see if Debo goes or not. Because I don't know if the books are really going to make Juwan Jennings like a plus 240 or something, uh, you know, as an anytime touchdown scorer if Debo's rolled out. But that all that being said, Juwan Jennings is easily the most reliable wide receiver on that team outside of Brandon Ayuk uh, and Debo Samuel, obviously. You know, he ran 12 more routes last week than Ray Ray, Ray, Ray McLeod. Uh, he actually had a pretty decent performance. He had some big catches in that game, too. Uh, he's been a reliable player, and that's why they kept him around uh, in that offense, uh, you know, for, for Kyle Shanahan. So this Detroit secondary, too, you you can't overstate how bad it is. I mean, it's it's really not a good secondary. So I want to attack that. And I'm going to attack that on the perimeter with their wide receivers. I think Juwan Jennings as an anytime touchdown scorer is kind of intriguing. And that number is lengthened to plus 350 for Juwan Jennings. Perfect. So that's intriguing. And he also is going to be out there, you know, Debo plays. Yep. And like you mentioned, Debo could play hurt, which he has done this year. And he did that for weeks four and five, wasn't super effective and wasn't heavily utilized in those games. So I do think there's a path to a good game for Jennings, even if we do get Debo Samuels yep. or Debo Sam playing in this game. All right, that is JJ Zacharies, and make sure you check him out on Twitter at Late Round QB. Find his work at LateRound.com and the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. JJ, like I said, it's been a delight to have you on the show. Past couple of years, appreciate it as always. Good luck to you in the uh, conference championships and for the offseason as well. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it, buddy. All righty. Find JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB. And again, find the podcast, uh, the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. If you want the prospect guide, make sure you check that out by going to LateRound.com where you can get your pre-orders in right now. We're going to talk some APL for the upcoming match week, which begins on Tuesday in just one second here with Austin Cass. But first, as a reminder, when it comes to the NFL playoffs, you got to win one game at a time. But when you bet the NFL playoffs on FanDuel, one game can mean a lot of wins. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, has all your favorite bets like the money line and spread. There's all sorts of prop bets like quarterback, passing yards, or who will score the first touchdown. Plus, every day there's an NFL playoff game. FanDuel is giving all customers a no sweat, same game parlay. That means when you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payday, you'll get bonus bets back if your SGP does not win. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports book partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. Minimum three leg parlay required. Refund issued as non withdrawable bonus bets, which expire seven days after receipt. 
Max refund $5 unless otherwise specified. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, Virginia, and Vermont. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9 with it in Indiana, 1-800-522-522. 4700 in Kansas and Wyoming, or visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1 770 stop in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland, and 1 800 gambler.net in West Virginia. Let's bring on Austin Cast now to talk about some EPL match week 22. No action this weekend, but they do pick up with again on Tuesday. You can find Austin on Twitter at Austin Cast. He is a senior editor for us here at FanDuel Research. Austin, happy Friday to you. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing really well, Jim. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you going to cope with no EPL this weekend? Uh, you know, there's fewer football games on. There's no EPL. What are you going to do with the, the free time outside of, you know, dad stuff, I guess? Yeah, I don't know. I might actually watch some college basketball, which I haven't done much of this year so far. Okay. So, okay. I, I don't know. I got to go to the DePaul Marquette game on Wednesday uh, over the Northwestern Illinois game for some reason. Weird choice on my behalf, but Red Panda was there for halftime. So I feel like it was a a good choice, despite the fact I actually missed out on a Northwestern win. So, you know, uh, regardless, I can live with that. Let's take a look here at the schedule for match week 22. Again, the first matches begin on Tuesday, but on Wednesday, pretty fun match. we got Liverpool taking on Chelsea. Liverpool has had a very good year, obviously. Chelsea has not thus far, but Liverpool may be showing some vulnerability recently. Their money line is minus 160. Anything stand out to you for this match on Wednesday, Austin? So, yeah, I, I actually really like that Liverpool money line at minus 160. Um, there's a few reasons why it's as short as it is. Uh, probably the biggest one is Mohamed Salah is out due to injury for Liverpool. He's their best player, top goal scorer. So he's obviously a big miss, but... Uh, Liverpool at home are just excellent. Uh, they, that's It's been that way throughout their club history, and uh, the Anfield advantage has certainly been alive and well under Jurgen Klopp. Uh, they lead the Premier League in expected goal differential in home matches, according to FB Ref's XG model. Through 10 home fixtures, they have eight wins and two draws, and even without Salah, they have plenty of attacking talent in Luis Diaz, Diogo Jota, Darwin Nunez, and Cody Gakpo. Uh Chelsea have been a much better side than their place in the table indicates, which I think we hinted at in a previous episode. Um, their XG differential is actually uh, fourth best and isn't that much worse than Liverpool's. But uh, the Blues have re really struggled away from home. Across all competitions, they've lost five of their past six away matches. And the lone non-loss uh, came away at relegation threat in Luton Town, and it was actually a match they lost on XG 1.5 to 2.3. And then on top of that, uh, just news broke today that uh, Jurgen Klopp's leaving Liverpool at the end of the season, their manager. That's a massive, uh, it's going to have a massive impact on the club overall, but it should also lead to a pretty emotional crowd and uh, performance from the players on Wednesday, if you want to head down Narrative Street. So uh, I think Anfield's one of the best home field advantages in Europe. And even though Salah is a, a big miss for Liverpool, one of the best players in the league, I like them to find a way to get all three points versus Chelsea. Uh, why is he leaving? They're like top of the table right now. What's going on? Uh, so he, he's been there much longer than an average manager stays yeah. at a club. Uh, and he just said he was starting to lose energy. Okay. So I think this is maybe year seven or eight for him. I'm not totally sure on that, but anytime a manager stays more than two or three years, honestly, it's pretty surprising. So yeah. we could see the same thing happen with uh, Pep Guardiola at City here in the next couple of years. It's just at a club like that, I think it's probably pretty exhausting to be in a position where you have to win pretty much every week yeah. or else you start coming under pressure. So, yeah, that's big news. So are we getting uh, like Jurgen Klopp to Sheffield United if he's tired of winning? Is that what we're going to see here next? Uh, I highly doubt that. I would mm -hmm. guess he'll take some time off and then end up at another big club here, or maybe the German national team. Okay. Well, if he does go to, to Sheffield United, you heard it for, here first. Just know we were, we were covering the spread. Uh, please cite us as being the source on that. Any other traditional market bets that stand out to you with where things currently stand? So, yeah, I'm going to stick with Wednesday and the uh, Manchester City versus Burnley match. 
Um, I like that to go over three and a half goals, which is minus 106. So uh, City in this match are going to be walking, welcoming back one of their club legends, Vincent Company, who's the manager of Burnley. And I think we're going to see a lot of goals. City haven't been their usual high-flying selves so far. They're just fourth in XG created. But they've still been able to thrash some of the lesser sides at home. In five matches against teams currently in the bottom eight, uh, City have amassed 17 goals, an average of 3.4 per match. Um, and that's just home matches. Sorry, I don't know if I clarified there. But uh, Burnley are currently 19th. They've conceded, they conceded three at home against Man City in match week one. And they've given up exactly three goals in each of their last two away matches against teams currently in the top four. I actually think there's a chance that City could cash this on their own. And I, I almost recommended Man City over three and a half goals at plus 158. And I don't hate it. But I like the added security of taking the overall match to go over three and a half because Burnley has shown a little more attacking punch lately. They've scored in each of their last three away matches, including twice at Aston Villa. And Villa's been one of the best home teams in the league this season. And City have actually given up at least one goal in each of their last nine home matches, including one to Bournemouth and two to Crystal Palace. So, uh, yeah, those those sides are somewhat similar to Burnley. So. All in all, I think we're going to see goals. And even though I don't mind City uh, over three and a half at plus 158, I'm going to play it a little safer and take uh, the match overall to go over three and a half at minus 106. Now, we had talked earlier on about City and their struggles, relative struggles this year. Based on looking at the recent scores, it looks like they've turned that around. Is that reflected in the XG data as well? Does it seem like they've kind of figured out whatever led to that, you know, November, December kind of lull? Yeah, it does. Um, this is kind of the time of year where cities start to do this every year anyway. And we saw something similar last year when they chased down Arsenal in the league. But um, they're getting Kevin De Bruyne back. He, he came in uh, for their match at Newcastle, played 20 minutes, had a goal and an assist. So, uh, And that was at Newcastle. It's a really tough place to play. So he's a huge piece for them. Uh, Erling Holland's been out for a few weeks. He should be back soon as well. Um, so they're getting healthier and honestly, they probably were just underperforming the first few months anyway. I don't know if that was just a lull from coming off the amazing high of their trouble last year, or if it was just random variants or what, but they definitely are starting to look like the man city that we've seen the last few years. Okay. So Austin is on Liverpool minus 160 on the money line as they take on Chelsea. And then the Man City and Burnley match to go over three and a half goals, which is minus 106 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. That is Austin Cass. As mentioned, make sure you find him on Twitter at Austin Cass. You can find his work over at FanDuel Research as well, where he is a senior editor. Austin, appreciate the time as always. Uh, enjoy a kind of free weekend. Do as you please. And we'll talk to you once again next week for Match Week 23. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. Alrighty, again, find Austin on Twitter at Austin Cass. We'll get him back on here next week in the time between the Super Bowl and the Conference Championships to talk more EPL then. That is all that we have here for today and this week on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to JJ Zach Reese and our first guest for swinging by, talking some props. Find JJ on Twitter at LateRoundQB, LateRound.com, and the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. I am on Twitter at Jim Saunas. You can find me on threads at Jim.Saunas, and you can find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get notifications as these shows go live each and every day. I'll be going up on Monday with my first look at Super Bowl 58, outlining where my numbers show value based on the opening spread and total at FanDuel Sportsbook. Have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy all the fun conference championship action. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 